August 19, 2025. Exactly 8.01 a.m. A Russian fuel train with 30 wagons was heading towards Crimea. Road convoys were being targeted. The sea route was at risk. The railway was therefore critical. It was mandatory and one way for Russia. The train had to take this route. However, there was no escape lane. The train drivers were unaware that they were being monitored. And soon, dozens of bomb-laden drones dive into this giant train. Ukrainian intelligence was set up in layers. Visibility was limited in this area for unmanned systems, but signal strength could be concentrated. This was an advantage for guided drone attacks. The intelligence network produced a hybrid map combining satellite images, listening devices, and electromagnetic signal reflections. Optical and thermal satellite images were matched. Commercial SAR packages were also added. The enemy's signal jamming and camouflage were penetrated. Station GSM traffic was monitored. Locomotive telemetry was captured. The day and time the train would pass were determined through both signal intelligence and exposed secondary supply plans. The convoy's estimated speed was recorded. The intersection point was marked. The UAVs were deployed in a formation consisting of three segments for the attack. The first segment was targeting. The second segment was the dive strike. The third segment was signal backup and return sabotage. The drones used were modified high-temperature resistant kamikaze platforms called Malyuk V2. Their range capacity was 210 kilometers. The guidance system supported both GLONASS and GPS signals. Data links were encrypted at the AES-128 level and included a satellite-based recall algorithm. Each drone weighed 5 kilograms, was covered in polymer, and was equipped with a low-density explosive capable of generating a shockwave at 9,000 meters per second. The target was not the wagons themselves, but the fuel inside them, which was intended to be used against the wagons. Ukraine classified such attacks as self-igniting targets. In other words, the drone only initiated the ignition, while the destructive energy was provided by the target's own materials. Therefore, the attack was designed not as a munitions battle, but as a chain of destruction triggered by fuel. The timing of the attack was determined based on the daily train traffic density on the line. On the morning of August 19th, there were only two scheduled crossings on this line. The first was a civilian cargo convoy, which had likely left the line by dawn. The second was the targeted fuel train. The train at the primary target departed from the Tokmak Regional Control Center. Its direction was south, toward Urojayan. The train consisted of a total of 30 wagons. Each wagon contained an average of 5 tons of liquid fuel. This amounted to approximately 150 tons of highly flammable material in total. The first six wagons were carrying aviation-type fuel. The middle 12 wagons were filled with diesel fuel. The remaining 12 wagons contained blended industrial fuel. The locomotive was a TE33A diesel model. This model was a heavy-duty locomotive capable of reaching speeds of 100 km per hour equipped with 12 cylinders and 3,300 horsepower. Thus, the train not only transported cargo, but also possessed significant kinetic energy on its own. Ukrainian drone operators launched the attack as the train reached the most congested and inaccessible segment of the track. The first Malyuk V2 drone dove into the 14th car, one of the units carrying diesel fuel. The explosion hit the lower central section of the car. The diesel vapor ignited due to internal pressure, the liquid began to burn. Approximately seven seconds later, the aviation fuel in the adjacent 13th car reacted. The first chain reaction had begun. The second wave targeted the 16th and 17th cars. These were closer to the rear half of the train. The explosion increased the temperature and shock wave in this section. This caused the train to split into two. The front 13 cars could not complete their forward movement and derailed. The rear 17 cars remained on the tracks, engulfed in flames. Due to the heat, the concrete sleepers of the track cracked. When the steel rails reached temperatures exceeding 620 degrees Celsius, they lost their structural integrity. The rails bent. The third wave targeted the fourth car. This car was also carrying aviation fuel. The locomotive's body shifted from its position due to the explosion. The front wheel set came off the tracks. The engine compartment swelled due to pressure. The attack lasted a total of 6 minutes and 48 seconds. A total of 7 drones were used. Each drone carried out a single effective strike. The total length of the track destroyed in the attack was measured at approximately 312 meters. The Ukrainian armed forces issued an official confirmation message. 
Video footage of the attack was released by global media sources later that afternoon. The footage clearly showed the moment of the explosion, the size of the fireball, and the deformation of the tracks. For the first 90 seconds after the attack ended, only flames and smoke were recorded along the track. According to visual recognition data, the flame column formed after the explosion reached a height of 27 meters. The fire spread due to the combination of high surface temperatures from fuel vaporizing in the diesel wagons. The fire advanced along a 200-meter section of track within the first three minutes. Approximately 40% of the steel rails were structurally bent. Due to thermal radiation after the explosion, all the dry grass in the surrounding area caught fire. The high density of fuel vapors caused the fire to spread not horizontally, but in drooping flames. This created an explosion effect that redirected the pressure wave, keeping the track at the center rather than damaging surrounding structures. It was noted that unmanned aerial vehicles continued to record data after the attack. The Malyuk V2 drones were programmed not only for the strike, but also for post-explosion analysis. Each drone was equipped with a low-resolution thermal camera in its nose section. These cameras transmitted the thermal map of the explosion to the operator center. This data was used to determine whether wagons that had not been reached by the explosion should be targeted again. However, a second wave of attacks was not planned for the operation. Therefore, after transmitting their post-impact data, all drones initiated their self-destruction protocol. RF communication intensity in the area increased during the attack. When comparing the communication patterns of Russian systems before and after the attack, it was determined that there was a complete communication blackout during the first 10 minutes of the incident. The first contact between the units responsible for protecting the train and the logistics command in Tokmak was established 12 minutes after the explosion. During this time, no data flow was possible between the scene of the incident and the central command. The main reason for this was the disruption caused by the drones in the electromagnetic bandwidth. The attack was not only physical destruction, but also meant the collapse of information flow. It took approximately half an hour for firefighting teams to arrive at the scene. The first two fire trucks dispatched from the Tokmok Regional Center could not approach within one kilometer due to the high temperature. Access to the high temperature zone was only possible using military fire control vehicles. These vehicles reached the scene only an hour later. During this time, the fire completely destroyed the wagons containing diesel and jet fuel. The fire lasted for two hours and 46 minutes. It then began to gradually subside. During this time, six secondary fires were recorded at six different points in the local area. These fires were not caused by drone strikes, but developed due to flying, flammable debris. The first images from the scene clearly showed that the rails had been bent into a U-shape. The tensile strength of the rail steel was between 540 and 620 MPE. However, at temperatures above 750 degrees Celsius, this strength decreases by up to 40%. Analyses revealed that this threshold had been exceeded on the rail surface. This meant that the track had to be completely replaced. At least a 400-meter section of the track became inoperable. Since the rail infrastructure was damaged, replacing the superstructure alone was insufficient. This section of the Tokmak Urojain line was constructed using a double track system with concrete block foundations. Therefore, repair work could not be limited to replacing the rails and sleepers. It was recorded that the ground in the area had settled by 12% due to thermal shock. This posed a permanent risk for future freight transport on the same line. Additionally, most of the signaling cables in the area had melted due to the fire. At least four days of engineering work were required to reinstall the railway communication signals. It might have been necessary to wait even longer. During this process, the Russian military's railway supply line to Crimea was completely suspended. Only civilian class low volume road transport could be switched to. However, this method could only meet 17% of the daily supply volume. This led to a serious supply crisis for Russian troops at the front, including armored vehicles, artillery batteries, and units in need of fuel. 12 hours after the attack, the Russian military administration convened an emergency meeting. Initial assessments suggested that the attack was an act of local sabotage. However, satellite images and social media videos leaked within hours revealed that it was a direct drone attack. Additionally, the precision of the explosion sites indicated that the attack was carried out not from within, but through high-precision remote guidance. The railway line was completely shut down after the attack. The Tokmak Euroshane A line was the only railway channel connecting Crimea to the mainland. 
An average of four logistics trains were scheduled to pass through this line daily. Each train carried an average of 900 tons of cargo. This amounted to a total daily supply volume of approximately 3,600 tons. When this line was closed, seven logistics centers directly in Crimea and on the southern front were affected. These centers relied on this line for the supply of ammunition, fuel, and water. Alternative transportation methods were both insufficient and posed security risks. Road transportation was not suitable for armored vehicles. Sea transportation had been halted due to Ukraine's Sea Baby class surface drone attacks. As a result, the Russian military faced a serious supply bottleneck in the rear for at least 72 hours. This disruption directly impacted the flow of fuel and ammunition for artillery systems. Additionally, planned shipments of tanks and ZTR-type armored vehicles were postponed. According to field reports, some battalions canceled their movement plans on August 20 due to the attack. This situation significantly slowed down the operational rhythm at the front. The total amount of fuel carried by the destroyed train was estimated to be approximately 150 tons. This is estimated to be equivalent to the operational fuel requirement of a mechanized division for three to five days. Among the fuel types was JP-8 class jet fuel. This was being transported for use at forward airfields behind the front lines by Russian air forces. The cost of the Malyuk V-2 class drones destroyed in the attack was approximately $38,000 each. The operational cost for the seven drones used was approximately $266,000. The market value of the fuel carried by the destroyed train was estimated at approximately $2.5 million. However, from a military logistics perspective, this loss was much greater. One wagon of JP-8 fuel is equivalent to 18 helicopter sorties. According to this calculation, the loss of six wagons means that over 100 air missions cannot be carried out. When such air missions are not conducted, the ability of ground troops to receive support is significantly weakened. The damage to the railway line also means strategic delays. It was reported that six full days were required for track repairs, ground reinforcement, and signal system restoration. During this period, no freight trains could use the line. This gap was strategically exploited by Ukraine to launch a second phase of attacks. The supply vehicles that had gathered at the northern exit of Crimea later became the target of different UAV attacks. So this operation was not just the destruction of a train, but a disruption of the logistics chain that continued with chain delays. Russia expanded its air defense perimeter in the first phase of the attack. However, the exact directions from which the attack originated via drones could not be determined. This is because the Malyuk V-2 class drones had the ability to change direction. Four different direction determining algorithms operated simultaneously in these systems. The flight path to the target could be changed up until the last second of the operation. This effectively reduced Russia's ability to intercept the drones to nearly zero. Additionally, since the drones flew at an altitude of less than 40 meters above ground, they were very difficult to detect by radar systems. The radar cross-section area was not sufficiently widespread. This further increased the success rate of the attack. Following the attack, Russia implemented a temporary countermeasure package as an interim solution. A small portion of logistics shipments was redirected to camouflage tanker convoys. However, this method was both slow and less efficient. The main supply load was still awaiting the repair of the railway line. Ukraine did not publish the drone signal and thermal recordings following the attack. The reason was the possibility that the same route could be reused by the Russian military. This signaled that similar attacks could be carried out in the future. Russia was forced to develop a comprehensive defense plan in response to this threat. It was announced that 17 new radar stations would be established along the route to Crimea following this incident. However, these infrastructure preparations would take at least two to three months. This meant that the railway line would remain at risk of attack with every subsequent crossing. Ukraine not only damaged the rear supply line with this attack but also gained psychological superiority. Targeting the supply line of a critical region like Crimea disrupted the moral balance. This attack was regarded as an effective example of modern asymmetric warfare in military circles. It was recorded as an operation that produced maximum results at a low cost. Russia will now have to spend more personnel, escorts and time on every logistical transport. This means waste of resources, fatigue and inefficiency. Ukraine, on the other hand, once again demonstrated its ability to strike strategic targets using unmanned systems. 
With every strike, the logic of traditional warfare was transcended. The train tracks turned into a battlefield. Fuel was used against the enemy. Communication control and incendiary effects were combined. The attack turned into a segment of the war that Russia lost in terms of both the front lines, strategy, and psychology. This operation demonstrated that Ukraine can gain superiority not only on the front lines, but also in logistics. In your opinion, how do such precision strikes shape the future of conventional warfare between Russia and Ukraine? Please share your comments below the video. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel and like the video. Thank you for watching.